Greetings and welcome to the Active Learning Week webinar hosted by Project Kaleidoscope and brought to you by the STEM Leadership Institutes. My name is Tanya Siemens and I am the Community Manager for STEM Central. Uh, STEM Central is an online networking platform of the Association of American Colleges and Universities and its Project Kaleidoscope. And STEM Central serves as a resource for networks of STEM faculty communities working to improve and transform undergraduate STEM education in the United States through the study and practice of broadening participation. So that's why we're all very pleased to be joined here today by Dr. David Leonard, who will be presenting his talk entitled, Beyond Diversity, Confronting Racism and the Obstacles to Equity and Justice on Campus. However, before we introduce uh, Dr. Leonard, I wanna take a moment to share about uh, what we're celebrating today, and that is Active Learning Week. Let's go. My slide advanced, there we go. Last year, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy announced Active Learning Day as part of a nationwide effort to improve STEM higher education. Over 40, 400 STEM faculty from 190 colleges, universities, and STEM-related professional societies joined us in taking the pledge to implement active learning strategies that are culturally responsive. For 2017, we've partnered with other STEM organizations to extend the value and impact of Active Learning Day beyond just a single day by introducing Active Learning Week. So how can you take the pledge, um, take part in Active Learning Week? You can go to stemcentral.net and um, click take the pledge and taking the pledge just means to choose one um, or all of the following actions this week, next week. Spend at least 10 minutes implementing a culturally responsive STEM teaching strategies that promotes active learning in your classroom. Um, you can identify innovative ways to deepen and extend your departmental and institutional commitment to inclu inclusive STEM higher education reform throughout the week, academic year, and beyond. Um, reach out to one colleague in either STEM or non-related STEM discipline and engage in a dialogue around what they can do to implement similar strategies in their classroom. Um, tweet or post about what you did using the hashtag Active Learning Week 2017. And if you like to make a movie or a video about um, what you did, um, we would love to showcase it on STEM Central. A two minute video um, can be really impactful. The deadline is tomorrow. So register your pledge by tomorrow, October 20th, and you can go to stem, stemcentral.net. So happy Active Learning Week next week. And now it's my pleasure to introduce, if the slide will advance for me, Dr. David Leonard. Okay. Dr. David Leonard is a professor at Washington State University Pullman. He is the author of Playing While White, Privilege and Power, On and Off the Field, and After Artist, The NBA and Assault on Blackness. He is also co-editor of Visual Economies of In Motion, Sport and Film, and Co-Modified and Criminalized, New Racism and African Americans in Contemporary Sports. Um, his work has appeared in the Journal of Sports and Social Issues, Cultural Studies, Critical Methodologies, Game and Culture, as well as several anthologies. And Leonard is also a past contributor to The Undefeated, New Black Man, Feminist Wire, Huffington Post, Chronicle of Higher Education, and The Urban and Urban Cusp. So we are very honored to have you today, uh, David. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm going to go ahead and um, stop sharing my screen and pass the um, baton over to you. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you for that generous and wonderful introduction. Um, and thank you and Kelly Mack and everyone at Project Kaleidoscope um, for having me. Uh, and hopefully, hopefully everyone can see the screen now. Um, let's see. Yes. Yep, we can see it. Uh, and thank you everyone um, uh, for joining uh, us. It's, it's very exciting to see uh, over 120 uh, I think 122 to be exact, people uh, joining this webinar, it, it, it's really actually inspiring um, and points to not only the investment um, in issues of equity and justice um, on our campuses um, and in the broader community, 
uh, but but the stakes. Um, so before I start, I, I wanted uh, to make note that that we want this to be um, as in our interactive as possible while we have a very short amount of time um, and clearly a lot uh, to talk about. Uh, we, we do want to to make this interactive. So please uh, type questions in the comment box as we're going and we will try and get to them um, as well as leave time at the end for, for question uh, questions and answers. And if we run out of time, we will certainly, uh, uh, with, with respect to questions, I will be following up um, after the webinar. So I wanted to start by making clear that one of the great obstacles um, to not only diversity on college campuses, um, in our disciplines, in our departments, uh, but also justice and equity and transforming campus and departmental and disciplinary climates is the way that universities function as silos, uh, function in ways that don't allow collaboration, that don't uh, take advantage of the diversity uh, on our on our campuses and in our spaces and i wanted to start with with a story from my own campus um, several years back i had written several pieces online uh, for various publications about issues of of race and racism and, and, and university culture and i got a a call from someone who ha was working working on our campus on issues of uh, gender in inequity in STEM, and uh, she and a co-PI had gotten a, 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 an advance grant, um, and they wanted to talk to someone uh, about the resistance and reluctance to talk about race and white privilege um, in, the, in the work that they were doing. Um, and it, it led to really fruitful conversations and, and the further development of this work. Uh, but what was striking in our conversations was how she uh, came uh, to me. Um, her co-PI uh, was at a university in North Carolina who had read my work on one of, uh, one of the blogs that I had published on and suggested me. So here there was someone across the country who is reading my work in a public venue uh, who encouraged someone who was right down the hill from me uh, to reach out. Uh, and not only did she not know about me, I didn't know about the work that she was doing. And this speaks to the ways that university cultures um, exist in these silos that, that, that limit conversations across disciplines, that limit the power and potential um, in diversity. So in, in recent years, we've seen protests um, across the country, um, waged by black students, by students of color, um, and their accomplices and allies, uh, protesting uh, issues of, of racism, of inequality on college campuses. This has happened online and on campuses. And I think it's important because to, to start here because so often we talk about the changes that are taking place, um, albeit gradual and albeit uh, uneven um, and lose sight of, of who is fostering that change. And that change is happening through the demands and the organizing and work of students. Um, in response to uh, these protests, uh, university ad ad administrators um, who have often been resistant uh, to change um, throughout the history of higher education in this country and who often hide behind the politics of free speech um, have latched on, on, on to certain trends um, uh, beyond the impulse to hire uh, vice presidents um, and, and, and others uh, in, in administration. Um, there's been an embrace of discourses of diversity and quote unquote cultural competency. And a quick word on diversity. Uh, it must be a starting point rather than an end goal. Diversity initiatives must come alongside of efforts to transform campus climate and institutional arrangements. 
cultural competency at the same time as a practice doesn't lead us towards this goal. The push for cultural competency lets those with power and privilege and the institutions that fall short off the hook. So let me give you a quick definition of cultural competency for, from the National Institution of Health. Uh, quote, culture is often described as the combination of a body of knowledge, a body of belief, and a body of behavior. It involves a number of elements, including personal identification, language, thoughts, communications, actions, customs, beliefs, values, and institutions that are specific to ethnic, racial, religious, geographic, or social groups. For the provider of health information or healthcare, these elements influence beliefs and belief systems surrounding health, healing, wellness, illness, disease, and delivery of health services. The concept of cultural competency has a positive effect on patient care delivery by enabling providers to deliver services that are respectful uh, and, of and responsive to the health beliefs, practices, and cultural and linguistic needs of diverse patients. It is crucial that we move beyond models of cultural competency, diversity training, and, and multiculturalism to deal with institutional racism. As you should have heard with that definition of cultural competency, it didn't reflect on inequalities. It didn't reflect on history. It didn't reflect on institutional racism. According to Abrams and Moho, quote, an overarching critique of the cultural competence framework is that it does not reach far enough for addressing systemic and institutional oppressions. Similarly, Raznick and Jeffrey uh, contend that the fundamental problem of approaching racism in the cultural sensitivity framework is uh, the leveling of oppressions, which instructors and students might find more comfortable and fair because it avoids a hierarchy of oppression, but it leaves unquestioned the racialized values and beliefs that derive our fundamental social institutions. So it lets us as individuals and institutions off the hook for looking at how our policies, how our cultures, how our institutional uh, arrangements uh, perpetuate those inequalities. It focuses on transforming the, uh, the cultural responses uh, to a per perceived difference. Um, so there are ample criticisms of cultural competency, but let me just focus on a few. One, it focuses on the individual. Change becomes about individual change, um, about learning how to deal with quote unquote difference um, in new ways. It imagines uh, the other. So in, in not only imagining those who don't fit the dominant uh, narrative and the dominant stereotypes of, of who is the norm, uh, it, it, it imagines the other. Um, in this regard, cultural competency normalizes whiteness, it normalizes masculinity, heterosexuality, Americanness. The goal is to understand and how to interact better with quote unquote the other. It equalizes oppressions. Uh, it sees difference through culture rather than history inequalities and various levels of privilege. It also encourages a passive approach. Uh, one, to be competent, and I, I guess we should always question like, why is competence um, a goal? Um, in, in an era of assessment that many of us might have uh, critiques of, uh, competence isn't even the goal of assessment. Mastery um, is the goal. Yet we have an entire field and approach that, that is increasingly central to universities uh, responses to racism on campus where the goal is competence. Um, it also presumes a fixed identity as if I, I did X and now I am competent. Um, some places even give you certificates that authenticate uh, that level of competency, which always makes me ask not only about this, but also the notions of allies. If, if someone does something wrong, if someone falls short, uh, do they lose the certificate? Is there an effort to revoke um, that stamp of approval? Um, but more than that, what we need to begin to talk about is, is not cultural competence and not being not racist, but being anti-racist, being anti-sexist, of enacting identities and policies that actively engage in transforming 
um, and challenging uh, racism and inequities on our campus. And this requires uh, looking at institutional arrangements. This requires looking at inequities, um, looking at policies. And I think that's really important and where cultural competency falls short. The other ways that it follows short is it allows us to look elsewhere as opposed to ourselves. And one of the, the really important things um, that I want to get through our short time together is, yes, we need to be active in transforming and being responsible for changing the landscape, the culture, uh, the policies that foster inequities. Um, we need to be responsible for those institutional shifts. But the work also needs to be done with ourselves. And cultural competency allows us to look elsewhere. And what's important is that we keep calm and look in the mirror. To confront injustice, to confront racism, to confront inequality requires looking in the mirror for not only we can, what we can do as individuals, but how those with historically and systemically produced privilege can be allies and accomplices towards change. And at the same time, we have to account and look in the mirror to see how race and racism shapes our own experiences. If I had, oh, sorry. If I had a lot of time, I, I, I'd, I'd lay out my entire biography here um, and, and to show the various signposts in my own experience that not only taught me about how racism operates in society, but how racism shapes my own experiences as someone of immense power and privilege. This takes looking in the mirror. Um, so the two kind of signposts that I want to highlight is one from my undergrad um, and, and one from graduate school. As an undergrad, um, I was at UC Santa Barbara and I took a Chicano feminism class. And there was about 55 uh, students in this class. Uh, there were 52 Chicano women, uh, two Chicano males, and myself. Um, rather than look in the mirror and to confront uh, the issues, the teachings, the conversations that were taking place in the class, um, I decided I would sit as far back in uh, in the classroom as possible. If I could have sat outside, I would have, because I didn't want to look in the mirror. I didn't want to confront my discomfort. I didn't want to uh, be someone who, quote unquote, said the wrong thing and then got called out. I didn't want to be accountable. So I sat in the back. Um, and when I had a, a professor who refused to let me do that, she told me that I had a responsibility and I had to be accountable and I had a role. I had a role in the class. And so um, she, um, in many ways, looking back, knowing what I know about uh, stereotype threat, um, she actually combated uh, my feelings, not that I was uh, struggling with stereotype threat as we, as we know it, um, but she basically reminded me that the diversity of the class, what I brought, mattered and would enhance the classroom. Um, so she kept pushing me. And then one day we were in uh, small groups and we were talking and I kind of, uh, uh, these discussions came up and my anxiety came up. Um, and a, a, a woman in the class said, now you know how we feel. Now you know what it feels like to be the one and only. Now you know what it feels like to be representative. Now you know what it feels like to be in that spotlight. Um, and I had a moment where I was like, no, I, I still don't get it. Um, I experience this twice a week for 75 minutes. Um, and even that experience is very different. Um, but then I leave class um, and I'm back into the sea of whiteness known as UC Santa Barbara. And this really forced me to think about the way in which power and privilege um, and inequalities operated on the college campus. Uh, skip ahead several years, I'm in grad school at UC Berkeley. Um, I'm in my last year, I, uh, last year 
I'm teaching a large class um, and I have several TAs, a large class on, on, on racial inequality. Um, and two incidents happened that really shaped um, me in that moment. One was, you know, I, I had majored in black studies. Uh, I had, uh, you know, spent the last 10 years of undergrad and grad uh, studying race and racism, um, writing, uh, working on my dissertation. So in many ways, I, 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 I believed falsely that I was quote unquote woke, um, that I was conscious. Um, there was a level of complacency um, where I thought I got it. Uh, and I remember walking with a TA, an African-American woman, uh, a good friend of mine, um, who in, in the first or second week of class said, hey, have you looked at your reading list for the class? And I said, no, uh, of course I did. I, I, I put it together. It's like, did you notice that all the books that you assigned are written by white men? And not only ha uh, had I not, which says something in itself, I hadn't even thought about it. So here I was, someone who, who was immersed in the work and yet I still was perpetuating and centering the voices of white men. I still wasn't centering uh, the voices and experiences and intellectual work of scholars and activists of color. I had to look in the mirror. Several weeks later, uh, I had a, a guest fellow grad student come in and give a lecture, African-American male. He spoke about the criminal justice system brilliant, uh, just mesmerizing uh, and informative lectures. I was so excited when he finished to go back into class and discuss. And he, uh, students raised their hands and were like, well, he was really angry. He was really sarcastic. He was upset. Uh, they questioned his pedagogy. They questioned his preparedness. They questioned his politics. And beyond the fact that we stopped the conversation and said, well, we're going to have this conversation. He's going to be here. Uh, we're not going to have a conversation about someone in their absence. Um, but it really, and so we did, and we had a conversation uh, that following day in class about how students were reading him versus me how they saw me as objective and kind and someone called me a teddy bear. Um, and I was like, you know, I, I'm angry. How, how can you not be angry? Um, and what the moment taught me and challenged me to think about is not simply their reaction. And if I look back and now and look at the research in terms of how race, and gender shapes evaluations and what students perceive and um, studies on students perceiving accents um, and so much more. Um, it was a reminder of how my whiteness mattered in that space, um, how my whiteness shaped not only student interactions with me, um, but student interactions with the material. So when I think back on this, um, it's really striking and it's something I continue to think about in terms of how can I navigate this and how do I use the, that power and privilege in, in empowering ways. Um, but it also gets me thinking about how when, when, when I talk about this information and when I've written about this uh, in various locations, I often get this feedback that, well, race matters to you um, because you teach ethnic studies. Race matters uh, to you because that's your work or some people you know, take a more uh, critical, i.e. reactionary uh, perspective of, well, you just talk about race because uh, that's all you see. Um, whereas I'm quote unquote more evolved as we have Stephen Colbert here, um, I don't see race. Um, and what Colbert's point here is 
that when we say I don't see race, we're just normalizing whiteness. We're just normalizing the experiences of ourselves as universal. And so when I hear people say, well, race doesn't matter in my classroom because we're talking about facts or we're talking about data or we're talking about math or we're talking about theories. It challenges us to think back to how race matters as we're standing in the front of the classroom. Um, it, it challenges us to think about how we often see racism um, as only mattering where there's open examples of hostility and tension. Um, it allows us to normalize and ignore the lack of diversity in these spaces. So you'll hear people say, well, race doesn't matter because, and I'll, I'll even use an example outside of uh, our classrooms. I have students tell me all the time, well, race didn't matter in my school or race didn't matter in my community because it was all white. In other words, segregation or the history of inequalities or policies that lead to a space being overwhelmingly white is then justified to you, justifies, used to justify claims that race doesn't matter. At the same time, the I don't see race or race doesn't matter in the STEM classroom or race doesn't matter in the absence of hostility um, erases the way that power and privilege operate in these spaces. Um, it ignores history, the way that race has been central throughout the history of this country as it relates to science, the way that race and racism has gained legitimacy and been justified through quote unquote science. Um, so that the idea that the classrooms that are based in facts or the scientific method are not political and are not spaces where race and racism uh, exist, erases this history. Um, according to Sophia Noble, to be educated is to see these things in more complex ways. Things that were previously simple are not so easy to explain some anymore. We've metaphorically moved from simple addition to calculus in the study of social sciences. Yet I am doubtful that my counterparts in the math department have to employ the same kind of pedagogical strategies and emotional uh, work we do as black women, faculty in the social sciences and humanities to have students comprehend it, the research and accept it as from legitimate experts. So there in itself, as she points out, race matters in terms of how students view these conversations, how students, uh, what they challenge and what they accept. Um, race and racism has everything to do with our classrooms. These classrooms are a window into a broader social reality and race and racism are anchors um, in society. So it shapes our classrooms, our hiring, uh, our hiring, our tenure and promotion policies. It shapes the experience of students. You know, when students talk about whether it be feelings of imposter syndrome, or if we look at research about stereotype threat, uh, whether we, you know, what the experiences of what it means to not have a, uh, a black faculty member um, in STEM through an entire career, what it means to be the one and only, and then individuals say, well, race doesn't matter here, um, denies and ignores their experience. It sends a dangerous message. Um, not only to their, about their experience in the classroom, but how issues, whether it be Charlottesville or Charleston or Ferguson um, to other college, what's going on on other college campuses, shapes their own experiences to presume that the racism they, ex they experienced on Saturday night when going to a party doesn't matter in the classroom doesn't account for the ways that racism and racism will affect the classroom, will affect them as individuals. It, so just to be clear, you know, we, we can, and I, you know, we can look at all sorts of different ways that race and racism um, shapes all of our classrooms from who we are as professors and how we're read, to things as I just mentioned, like stereotype threat, 
and imposter syndrome to even K through 12 education. You know, when we look at data on inequalities in terms of classrooms uh, and resources, uh, you know, if we look at studies that found that 50% of Native American uh, youth and, and Native Alaskan youth don't have access to, to fundamental science and math classes. We see how race matters. And so to ignore that, um, even if to ignore that, even if it's not in our classroom in this context of inequalities um, of resources, is to ignore the ways that race and racism shapes those classrooms. And so we need to think about, we need to think about how inequalities um, manifest in a myriad of ways. And this gets us to think about the difference between equity and equality. Um, just a note on these examples, I'm sure some people have seen um, these examples on uh, the left or, may or maybe a similar one. Um, there's one uh, that is often shown um, based or, or similar to the one at the top um, of equality and equity that shows uh, three individuals like the ones on the, the uh, top uh, trying to watch the baseball game and the equality one, everyone has the, the, the three um, uh, uh, boxes that they're standing on, whereas the equity one recognizes the differences um, and responds to them. Um, the, the, this person um, who modified it uh, added reality uh, to note the, those many advantages, those privileges, those sources of power uh, that are stacked one after the other throughout life, um, whether it be the number of AP classes in, at your school, um, the, types of, the types of teachers in schools, um, access to tutoring, um, having role models in the classroom, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I wanted to note the bottom one because I think it's a far better image. And um, before I speak on it, I think the fact that this one image that's widely circulated has been modified and challenged and has led to conversations um, that, that has advanced the discussions of equality and equity speaks to the value of diversity. Um, here you have online that, that, that people have circulated these images and people have questioned them and challenged them and, and reimagined them. And the, the one at the bottom, um, rather than having uh, the in three different individuals of different heights, um, which gives the impression that the issue is the people's heights rather than the different opportunities and the stigmas and the inequalities that are attached onto those bodies. Um, the one on the bottom has three bodies that are the same um, and three boxes that are the same um, on the left side. But what is different is the size of the fence uh, and uh, the ground. Um, and, and in reading the uh, description by the person who did this, uh, they said that the, the fence represents history um, and that, that history leads to uh, different obstacles. Uh, for different individuals, and that the ground represents persistent inequality that furthers uh, the, the differential access, the differential ability to participate um, on the field, and that equity um, is recognizing both that history and that inequality. It's recognizing the digital divide. It's recognizing the way that stereotype threat shapes our classrooms. Um, it, it, it's recognizing the, the various obstacles, um, not only the various obstacles that we can see on the right side, um, but the ways that, that some of our pathways are clear. Um, but you can see with, with, with both of, well, all three of these examples, um, a way to push back beyond the I don't see race or I don't see gender, uh, gender framework because those frameworks perpetuate uh, inequality. Even the presumption of equality, of treating all students the same way, of not accounting for those inequalities, perpetuates inequality. And this is why there has to be a level of consciousness towards equity. And so I wanted to finish off um, 
with two quick examples. Um, and this is one of the challenges of a, of a webinar because normally we would do this together. Um, but two quick examples that, that you could do even in your classrooms. Um, while I do it in my classroom, talking about race and racism and equity and equality, I could even Im imagine this in a classroom um, talking about various themes in STEM, uh, talking about uh, science education, you know, talking about the digital divide. And so here, the, the first one I do is imagine we're in a classroom uh, and I have a trash can at the front and I give a, a balled up piece of paper to three different students, one sitting at the front of the classroom, one in the middle and one in the back and ask them to make a basket. Clearly, that student in the front has a clear advantage. They have power and privilege where their ability to make that basket could be done with ease. Now, in many ways, the trash can exercise uh, both represents inequality, represents power and privilege, represents the, the daily consequences, whether we're talking about stereotype threat or microaggressions to those structural arrangements. Uh, it mirrors that, it represents that, but it also, it doesn't because it's so obvious. It's so clear that that person sitting at the front has an advantage. So imagine that not only we're doing the person in the front and the middle and the back making a basket, but imagine that everyone is sent out of the room and including the three participants and they come in one at a time and get to throw from the front, middle and back. And therefore they don't see that clear advantage that they have or the clear disadvantage or the inequality. Um, you know, so when we talk about the fact that, that white kids are more likely to have uh, broadband at home uh, and more, more, most likely um, to have access uh, to computers. Well, that's an advantage that helps not only with STEM, but overall education. Uh, but it's something that isn't even seen, isn't even reflected on. And in order to foster equity, we must recognize those differences. We must recognize the way in which uh, me as a white man, uh, my evaluations are not just about my teaching, but are about me and what my whiteness and my maleness mean in the classroom. Well, when I look at my CV and my publication, yes, it might reflect my hard work, but it also reflects who is asked to do service work and how race and gender shapes that. So the, that is all clear in who gets to shoot from the front of the room and who gets to shoot from the back. Another example I, I use is I ask students, um, and this is from uh, Stephanie Spaulding, a brilliant professor at University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. Uh, she uh, shared this exercise and, and it's been profoundly uh, important uh, for students, I think, in, in talking about the difference between equity and equality. And I asked students to give me uh, a pair of shoes. Um, I asked for eight volunteers, each to give me a single shoe. I take those shoes and I throw them in the corner. Uh, I leave them there for the entire classroom, uh, class time, excuse me. Um, and at the end of the class, um, usually students beat me to it uh, and say, can we get our shoes back? Uh, and then I hand out the shoes. Um, not only because of the exercise, I have no idea whose shoe is whose. Uh, so I just hand them out. They each get a left shoe. Um, that is equality. I tell them, well, you got a shoe. You got a left shoe. What do you want? You should figure out how to how to make it work. You should pull yourself into your bootstraps, so to speak, or into your shoe. And in many ways, it maps how we approach 
race and racism on the college campus of, well, we were going to treat everyone the same. Well, in treating everyone the same, we're treating everyone unequally. We're replicating and mapping those in inequities, both historic and, and on our own campuses, into daily practice. That we're not accounting for the different needs, the different shoe sizes, the different future plans. You know, imagine a student who's like, you know, I, I take that shoe, but I'm about to go work out or I'm about to go to work. And if I don't have the proper shoes, I might get in trouble. Or I might, I'm about to go into my lab. And if I have open toe shoes, that's dangerous. These are all the different ways that we can think about shoes um, as a window into this difference between equality and equity. And when we think about it, these are the questions that we need to talk about in, in, in our own departments. You know, when we're talking about hiring, do we account for those differential demands of service um, as it relates to race and gender? Do we account for the difference in the way that race and gender shapes teaching evaluations? These are all things that should be part of conversations about hiring, about tenure and promotion. Uh, and so that when we talk about diversity uh, as a goal, it has this, these sorts of discussions have to be part of our larger initiatives. What I wanna end with, and I got eight more minutes, and then I'm gonna stop at the most, um, is how we need to, to, to get uncomfortable. Um, one of the dangers in recent focus on implicit bias is how it normalizes bias, um, how it normalizes bias in all of us uh, and does so in a way that dehistoricizes it. Uh, but it also leads to discomfort like, oh, well, I, we all have biases. Uh, and what do you want me to do? It's, it's implicit, it's unconscious. Uh, I, I can't be responsible. Um, and we have to become both comfortable with this discussion about implicit bias, but also uncomfortable. We have to be uncomfortable with our biases. And I fear that the way we talk about implicit bias leads to a level of comfort. And we have to be uncomfortable in, a, in ways that leads us towards transformation. We need to get uncomfortable with the idea that race matters in some locations and not others. That it matters for some of us, that it's the responsibility for some of us and not others. Those of us with power and privilege need to take on that responsibility. We need to take on that responsibility as allies um, and accomplices. We need to become uncomfortable with the resistance from administrators, faculty, and students who claim there's a time and a place for discussions of race. Um, to, be, to be blunt, there's a time and a place, and it's right now, as well as tomorrow and the day after that. As we've seen in this country and on campuses across the nation, the stakes are too high to shift that moment elsewhere. Whether we are the ones bringing race into focus inside and outside the classroom or the ones who have the platform, the privilege and the power to support those doing the work, we each have a responsibility. We each have to ask ourselves, what can we do as chairs, administrators, faculty to better prepare students so that they don't think that this conversation has no place in our classroom? or only professors who are of color are responsible. Only they are carrying out these conversations. I want us to think about what does that message send to our students in terms of who and where this conversation needs to take place. We need to become uncomfortable with the belief that because 
race is part of everyday experience, I'm prepared to offer opinions and analysis in class. And so I'm not saying like, hey, because race matters, because the stakes are too high, because we need to push back at, at this narrative that discussions about race should only happen in these spaces, that that just means like, hey, let's bring up race today, or let's have a conversation, um, given what's going on in the news, as if there isn't preparation that's needed, that there isn't background, that there isn't scholarship, that there isn't work that's been carried out by individuals, scholars, scholars of color, activists of color for years. Um, there are people who are doing the work and doing this difficult work, and so we need to amplify those voices. Uh, to do the work successfully requires putting in the work each and every day. I mean, I deal with gravity each and every day. I, I don't find myself to be an expert on physics. Do that work and engage those who are fostering equity and justice um, in our fields and beyond. We need to get uncomfortable with the narrative of, of post-raciality and colorblindness as guiding principles. We need to get uncomfortable with the idea that diversity is the goal and cultural competency is our means to get there. We need to get uncomfortable with our collective complacency rooted in privilege, rooted in the idea that racism matters for someone else. We need to get comfortable in mandating that diversity is a starting point, as I said, and not a goal. We need to push beyond brochures and pie chart diversity to think about inclusion and justice, to clean away the obstacles, the microaggressions, the structural inequalities to diversity and justice. We need to be comfortable with taking risks especially when those risks are minimal because of the power and privileges we have. We need to focus on the comfort, uh, on comforting and empowering all students, recognizing that neither our comfort nor our universal narratives fit all approaches inside and outside the classroom. We need to be uncomfortable with claims that race has nothing to do with the classroom or certain disciplines given stereotype threat, given the ways that imposter syndrome shapes experience of students of color, first generation students, women, and other marginalized students. We need to be uncomfortable given those structural inequalities, whether we're talking about hiring, tenure and promotion, or countless other examples. We need to become comfortable with talking, or with not just talking, but listening. So often, institutions and the individuals that make up talk rather than listen. Listen to our students. Listen to faculty of color. Listen to those who are experiencing marginalization and disempowerment each and every day. And we need to take advantage of those spaces and places doing the work. I'm going to come back to, ooh. Um, one of the things that I've learned um, through my work with Project Kaleidoscope is the danger and the difficulty of those silos. Um, when I participated in the, the Leadership Institute um, and worked with Kelly Mack, Dr. Kelly Mack in, in other contexts, I've seen the power and potential um, in collaborative work. Um, in work that is truly interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary, that are grounded in a shared responsibility and investment in equity and justice. Um, so I really encourage you to look into Project Kaleidoscope and the STEM Leadership Institute. Um, I encourage you uh, to, 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 not, to look on your own campuses to see what sort of work is being done um, in other departments that can enhance uh, your classroom experience, your departments, and the work that you're trying to do, that enhances the experiences of your students. Um, and, and the STEM Leadership Institute uh, offers an experience uh, and, and collaboration and, and networks 
that can help that process both inside and outside of your own uh, campus. Um, and then, and then, lastly, um, to to think about ways to integrate these pedagogies, these questions, uh, these activities into your own uh, classrooms um, to to uh, challenge how we are teaching about equity, uh, to challenge how we are th thinking about justice. Um, that that our classrooms can be really powerful places to do that. So uh, I thank you um, for uh, spending a, a little bit of time with, with, with uh, us. Um, and I think we have some time uh, for a few questions. And then thank again, uh, I will certainly uh, answer questions uh, beyond that. Um, so let's open it up. All right, thank you so much, David. Very um, interesting, inspiring for me. So um, maybe if it's okay with people, we can stay a few minutes after the top of the hour to address more questions, but also to let you know that we will um, address your questions offline afterwards. So uh, we will, um, David will <laughs> address your questions. Yes, and I will try and be um, unacademic at the moment and not give nine minute answers for okay. questions. Okay. I might want to. <laughs> okay. I'm sure so, many, many know the occupational hazard in that regard. So um, the next question um, is from Lisette Torres Gerald, and I apologize for butchering anyone's name. Um, how do you feel about your privilege as a white man invited to speak about diversity in STEM when there are many colleagues of color doing this work? Um, I think it's an important question and it's something I, I think about and reflect on often. And I um, don't have, it, it's, it's something I have to account for. Um, and it's something that, that I know we talk about and make sure um, as an individual that, that I also amplify not only when I'm speaking, but also step aside in, in important moments. Um, that I don't uh, stand on the stage in, in every instance. Um, and so that there's a challenge of wanting to use your privilege um, as a source of change, um, and to use your privilege in ways uh, to amplify uh, the struggles, to amplify uh, uh, the fight for equality in an important way, but also uh, to not seize the stage, uh, to not be uh, the, the, the individual who, who, who grabs the mic in every instance. And I don't necessarily know um, the, the right balance in that regard. It's something that I, and I would say anyone um, in positions of, of power and privilege um, have to continue to ask themselves um, that, that they're doing work in multiple ways. Because um, as you note um, or in, in the question, much of this work has to be done uh, in places and spaces that aren't seen. Um, and it can't be always um, in those moments uh, of, of visibility and accolades um, and public, but it has to be done um, behind the scenes um, in ways that, that uh, are about the work. Um, thank you. Uh, the next question um, might be a little easier. <laughs> Um, but still, still really um, interesting to ask. Um, did you? Do, it's from Susie Blank. Blank. Do you know of any activist groups that are dealing with anti-racist, not diversity, issues in STEM, especially in higher ed? That are anti-racist groups. Uh, so specific groups. Um, I'm going to follow up with that one. <laughs> okay. Um, I can I can think of individuals, um, and obviously groups that are specific of dealing with 
um, African Americans in STEM um, that are dealing with Chicanos on Latino STEM and and groups that 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 are focused on the lack of diversity um, in STEM and obviously Pro Project Kaleidoscope um, would be an organization, but groups that are spe so specific. Um, and so the, those other groups that I mentioned um, are, are clearly engaged in anti-racist work. Um, but I, I'd rather put together, I'll put together a list of, of organizations and um, that that are very specific in this regard. Was That's something question. we can put onto uh, the, our website it, for this webinar. It, it's a good question and a, a good reminder of, of further education that I can do. Great, thank you. Um, this one comes from Kimberly Shaw. She asks, how can we address equity on our campuses without following to def falling into deficit thinking and invoking stereotype threat through our remedies? Ooh, um, that's another. That's a really good question. Um, well, one I think focusing on uh, cultural competency leads us down into those spaces of of, of stereotypes um, that that imagines uh, groups and communities. Uh, through flattened narratives and stereotypes. So I think uh, really looking into policies um, and uh, yeah, well, it'll just stay with policies that are impediments uh, to uh, diversity, uh, justice, and inclusion. And, you know, so I mentioned, you know, being uh, conscious of the way that racism and sexism shapes evaluations. Um, that is about focusing on the inequity and then uh, responding to those or, or, or uh, reading evaluations in that context. Um, same thing in terms of service demands. Um, it becomes about looking at, at hiring plans um, in terms of where, um, where uh, where we're advertising. Um, it, it, it becomes about uh, administrators demanding that not only uh, departments in their hiring plans uh, account for uh, a diversity plan, but have clear action items in terms of what are they, what are, what are we going to do to address um, the absence uh, of diversity in, in, in our uh, in our department, um, and, and and to get beyond the well, the applicants weren't there that we often hear, um, and so looking at those policies and those practices, um, I think, and the institution um, is an important step forward. Thank you. I'm the I'm just the repeater of questions here, so. Um... Thank you for that. Um, and I'm going to just do my best to read these questions from people as I come in. Um, first, I want to acknowledge that it is uh, three minutes past the hour. And so we understand if you have to go. And and, bef and um, just want to thank all of you who do have to leave now for coming and let you know that we will be posting the webinar recording on STEM Central. And in a few, in an hour or so, you'll get a follow up email asking to take a survey. Uh, give us your feedback on the webinar. So we look forward to engaging with all of you more in the future. Uh, but those of you who can stay, um, we're gonna stay a few more minutes to take maybe two or three more questions. Um, here's a question from Rajni Shankar Brown. In addition to intersection of racism and sexism, I think it is vital we talk about classism. In the activities you described earlier, do you discuss equity from a, a intersectional perspective and how. It, it is interesting that both the trash can and shoe example community, um, the, the, I'm sorry, it is interesting that both the trash can and shoe example community used in equity discussions favor physical privilege and also mm -hmm. speak to ableism. Are there any activities you use or recommend that focus specifically on intersectionality? 
Well, one, one, thank you. Those are really good, um, uh, good examples or good ways that we can further the discussion, um, both of uh, ableism uh, as well as class, um, and to to use those moments to to talk about access. Um, to you know, there's another example I have, and clearly, you know, when I'm using these examples. These are part of a, a larger discussion um, of, of racism over 15 weeks um, in which we talk about the way in which class um, and gender and sexuality and nationality and able-bodiedness fit into these discussions um, in connective ways, but also in intersectional ways. Um, one example I do, and you know, many people have, have seen this, um, is the privilege walk. Um, and uh, I have a class that ranges from 125 to 225 students. So obviously doing a privilege walk um, isn't um, possible. And clearly, you know, um, so what I've developed in that, in that class is using student response devices um, where students uh, click yes or no and in the course of doing that um, exercise on privilege, um, I've sought um, examples that uh, are very explicit in looking at intersectional um, to talking about um, the way in which privilege operates um, across multiple communities. So for example, um, one, um, uh, but, well, there's two examples, but I'll just kind of generally, there's questions on transportation, both flying um, and buses, uh, where uh, the conversation invariably leads not only to discussions about race um, in terms of uh, racial profiling or where bus routes are or where public transportation is, but also uh, how able-bodiedness um, operates in terms of public transportation class um, and, and a myriad of, of other ways. And so I think it's important, um, as you know, to, to, to uh, embrace an intersectional approach that looks at the connective tissue, but also doesn't um, simply uh, dehistoricize those oppressions and those inequalities um, in, in, in ways that, that they lose their the 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 importance of the discussion um, loses its meaning. So really, really helpful and uh, question. And um, we just got a quick question um, in following up on that, saying um, that asked if you were willing to share this expanded NSRS version of Privilege Walk <laughs> for with people um, um, in other sure. classrooms. <laughs> From Susan Walden, sure. us, if you could share that. I can put that together. I mean, it, it really took, um, yeah, I, I can put something together. At least some <laughs> of the some of the questions. Um, I kind of have a list, um, both from Peggy McIntosh's uh, uh, original Invisible Knapsack, and then online you'll find uh, various other articles where, where people have written about uh, privilege in the context of gender and sexuality um, and cisgenderedness and able-bodiedness. And so I've incorporated um, and continue to add to this list. Um, and so I can certainly kind of put one together in the coming days. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, all right, we have another question um, from Timothy Parker. Um, how do you prioritize political conviction with respect to seeking diversity on campus? Do you think that conservative thought, even traditional conservatism, as distinguished from the more reactionary populism of the far right today, is unfairly ignored or resisted on American campuses? <laughs> and do you, if you want to read these, you can look at the questions pane too in the control panel. If um, it helps. <laughs> Are you going to read it again? <laughs> I, I mean. I, again, I think, as I just mentioned, um, that it's important to talk about the way in which 
these inequalities are, 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 are situated historically and institutionally. Um, and so the idea that that conservative thought um, is excluded uh, when we look at the history of this nation, when we look at um, inequality, it, 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 it's a different discussion. Um, I also think, you know, when we look at uh, administration, when we look at um, the accountability that universities have to donors uh, and legislatures, uh, when we look at the lack of fact, the, the lack of faculty governance, um, uh, the, the notion that that um, universities are are bastions of progressive thought is not one that I that I've seen, um, and so I think it's a. I also think it's a different conversation, um, given given the um, given the nature uh, of racism and sexism, given the history, given the daily consequences um in, in terms of uh inequality inequalities uh and, and so much more okay these are a lot really interesting i'm losing i lost my control panel though here we go um let's we um i'm not sure what to do we have a lot of questions building up here and it's getting to be a little bit late um what do you think? Should we should we blast through them all, or maybe we should um, post them to Sim Central if we don't get to them, um, because we have them rolling in. So, <laughs> um, and I definitely yeah, want to yeah, address I, everybody's I, questions somehow. Yeah, I can I can answer a couple more. Okay. Let's see. <clears throat> um, this question from Elizabeth Stoddard. Um, when you have only one or two students of color or women in other underserved or other underserved students in your class, how do you avoid having activities like the privilege walk from marginalizing these students in the moment? Good question. Um, yes, I don't. This one's really hard. Um, this I, I think this is also why um, while the clickers was a result of classroom size, um, I like the clickers better because it allows for a visual um, where students can see percentage um, in ways that doesn't further that marginalization, that, that fur furthers that spotlight, um, that, that furthers um, that in inequality. Um, I mean, it, it's something uh, that that I think we should, yeah, that we we really have to think about um, of even something like the privilege walk. Um, how does you know, or talking about stereotypes in the classroom? Um, how does not how does not being um, centered in that conversation? Um, allow for it to happen, you know, as an, as a, as a white male professor, uh, you know, when, when, when I talk about uh, stereotypes or racial slurs, these are things that I, that I need to account for and think like, well, it, it is, is my uh, point of discussion, is my ability to have that discussion shaped by my disconnect um, from that history? Um, and are there other ways? And so I actually think the clickers allowed a, a, a way to have that conversation um, in in ways that that push back against that marginalization. But I think it's in in in, uh, in a larger context, it forces us to think about um, beyond our intent. Um, that our intent um, of in this case illustrating privilege um, can cause harm and pain, um, and we have to to always account for that. Um, or reflect on that and learn. Um, if 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 we fall on our face, if we stumble and um, are told like, "Hey, that might have been a great exercise uh, for 
for, for that group of students, but it made me feel terrible. Uh, and, and we have to account for that, um, of, of who we're centering and, 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 and um, who's learning at whose expense. Yeah. Um, let's, um, let's end it with this last question here from Jetta Foreman. She asks, um, instead of talking about cultural competency, we've been talking about the importance of cultural humility and cultural curiosity, which fits in well with this scientific habits of mind we try to inspire in our teaching. Wondering if you've heard these phrases before and what your thoughts might be on this reframing of cultural competence. Thank you. Sorry, I had a student knocking. Um, I haven't heard, um, I, I, I'd be curious to hear more about it. This is the, mm -hmm. the, the challenge of running out of time and, um, and the webinar, because again, it, it's still, um, in the focus on culture, um, still gives me it gives me pause um uh, uh, how does it hom homogenize how does it account for intersectionality how does it account for history how does it account for inequality um i mean i the the what so it's humility and what was the other one it says um we've been talking about the importance of cultural humility and cultural curiosity um, um, use these phrases. Hmm. Yeah, again, I, I think it's, 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 it's reframing. I like the, the notion of, of curiosity and, and humility at least are, are more active um, in terms of a process. Um, but I, I still think a, a, a focus on, on, active uh transformational anti-racist and anti-sexist work um that, that we need to name uh racism we need to name sexism and the work should be framed in in combating um those injustices those realities rather than um about kind of cultural cultures of of difference mm -hmm. I, I, I said it, that was the last one, but I'm going to uh, ask one more because I think um, I know Ashley was ex excited to ask a question or definitely and um, might be wanting to, me to ask this for her. Just came through um, or now a little minute, a few minutes ago, um, but this might be a good one to end on um, and thinking about um, how we can take action now in the future. And um, Ashley asked, how much influence, how much influence do you feel alumni have when if colleges and universities began to address these issues so how how what's the role and influence of alumni um i mean i think alumni have uh power and potential um to be agents of change um i think whether it's investing um in uh the work um and i'm gonna give just because i saw thank you lizette torres uh, Gerald, um, investing in organizations like Science for the People or Free Radicals, uh, who was that Torres Gerald mentions as, as anti-racist work, um, investing mm -hmm. in programs um, that, that are explicitly anti-racist, um, anti-misogynist, um, of sharing their own experiences um, in the classroom, uh, what it meant, um you know with respect to uh what it meant to have conversations about the digital divide or what it meant to to learn about the history of racism in the medical field or what it meant to not have any classes in a science department on um implicit bias in medical professions even though so many students are going on into medical fields um to to to, to speak back about their own experiences um, and I think investing in and demanding um, change is, is important. It's a powerful constituency um, that 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 can uh, use their voice and and their platform uh, in important ways. But I also think uh, 
we as with faculty and administrators uh, have work to be done and and, and should always uh, look in the mirror rather than looking elsewhere. Thank you so much. It's um, 20 minutes past the top of the hour. I appreciate all of you who have hung on um, for this long past um, for the webinar. It's been very interesting. And by the depth of these questions coming through, I, it seems like it's been really stimulated, lots of really good thinking. And um, I just want to thank you so much, David, for coming and presenting today. Can, can I, I add it. just to uh, uh, yeah. Lizette Torres, Gerald, I'm looking at the questions and um, mm -hmm. Your point about cultur cultural humility and curiosity, um, I'm just going to read the, the comment because it's spot on, um, that it still centers whiteness and reminds, she says, it reminds me of the days when science collected and displayed people at, at World's Fairs. Um, and, and I think it's a perfect, uh, perfect description of, of the dangers. And it also gives us an example of how we can use the classroom to have critical conversations about the continuity of history, um, of looking at the history of um, uh, racism uh, in science or racism in higher education. Uh, Stephen Wilder's book, Ebony and Ivy, um, really highlights or looking at the history of, of uh, medical racism um, and then and world's fairs and so much more, and then connect those to, to, the, to the issues that we're talking about today and to look at the continuity in language and ideology um, and inequity. And, and so I just wanted to point that out and, and really mm -hmm. thank not only Lizette, but, but everyone um, for their questions and comments because um, it, it was, it was a, a rewarding um, the question and answer um, uh, or the questions, let me not even, the answers, uh, I hope they were rewarding, but the questions mm -hmm. were really rewarding and challenging and and um, thank you. Yeah, and I, I'm afraid we didn't get to all of them. So if we didn't get to yours, we'll, we'll um, follow up with you through an email or through STEM Central. And um, quick reminder um, to, uh, Consider the STEM Leadership Institute and also remember to take the Active Learning Day and Active Learning Week pledge. It's happening next week, so join us for that. And so would you like to, any final, you. Final, final statement? No, and if, if anyone, um, I'll, I'll put together those PDFs and I'm going to build um, a, a list uh, starting with the, the two organizations. I'll make sure I include the two organizations that Lizette put. Um, for, for examples, and so if, if there are others um, that, that people know of, you can post them or you can email me along with any questions at uh, my email address is djl at wsu.edu. Um, and again, just a reminder that this is an example of the collaboration that can happen across fields, across institutions um, in, in really prof prof potentially profound ways. So. So thank you again for for having me and and for engaging and and the great questions and comments. Yep, and let's keep the conversation going. So thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and close the webinar now. So.